<laughs> well, here we go. Um, I, I've been thinking about last week's gathering, and it reminded me of one about, I don't know, maybe a month earlier, uh, when Charlie uh, opened the thing up to us and that. Uh, and after it was over, uh, after Charlie's presentation, the whole place went wild with preaching and teaching and the women were all in it, and the men were all in it. It was an absolutely marvelous response. Last week, the same thing happened. Um, though the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the kind of messages that were going on prior to it, but at, at the end of last week as well, we had marvelous uh, response from everybody. Everybody was into it. Uh, Sam was up there his neck in it, and he was calling us to insist on texts and and all that the text was saying, it was not just that, it was also this, and it was all great spirited. It was great, rich spirit. Why wouldn't it be? We're not only brothers and sisters, we're also friends. There were differences going on in it, which was remarkable. And I thought of the two of them quite a bit, those two, periods, Charlie's and, and, and then Jordy and then what followed. And uh, that never happens to when I'm talking. Uh, it, it's always, you know, it's always nice after it, but I don't generate that kind of wildness, uh, which is absolutely marvelous. I don't, I don't subscribe to the view that a good Bible class has to have everybody talking. I don't subscribe to that. I, I think the teacher, whoever he or she happens to be, um, uh, they, they have studied on it and they've spent the time on it and uh, others just come in. They haven't had time to do anything. You open the Bible up, know where we're going and all of that. So it, it so often ends up with a conversation about who I saw this week and uh, wasn't it funny and all the rest of it. Uh, that happens. But that is not what happened here in any one of those two. It was absolutely exhilarating. And I thought, and I mentioned this to the, the man who keeps our series going in, in a, a consistent, a hardworking way and keeps it all going so marvelously. That maybe sometime he uh, might, he'd think about it and he might invite you to bring your own questions. Um, the, the, the speakers determine, you know, what everybody's going to think about. And that, uh, I think that's characteristically okay. But because the other two so excited me with the joy that was there, the excitement, the, the, everybody was vibrating. And it was, those were two really great sessions. And I was thinking that it would be lovely uh, if we could have one of those, uh, and that'll be determined uh, by our leader in this matter. Um, but it would be good if he thought for a while on some questions that are not just personal uh, to you, not just personal to you, but issues that you think about and wonder about, or think about issues that are big to you in your life's setting and your life's needs that you would like to hear discussed. It would be a lovely thing uh, if you uh, were able to say, how about us discussing this tonight? For it, it you know, it, it, it's, it, it, I think it's an important issue, but it would, it would let you get in on it and feel like 
because you know you're a part of it anyway. No speaker sits here and talks to nobody. If you weren't here, there would be no speakers speaking. So this is not a one-man show, even when the speaker is the one who is just doing all the talking. But the good news about this arrangement, after the speaker and speaking, it's opened up and you can go where you want. But if indeed the, the two things that I mentioned brought us to where the speaker was speaking about in both occasions, that's even a greater uh, advantage. And I told Jordy after it that it was an abs I was I, I was just absolutely ecstatic about what went on last week and on the previous years with uh, Charlie. So maybe you'll maybe you'll think about that, will you? Yeah. Well, I'm not interested uh, tonight anyway. I'm uh, I'm the one that suggested the Jordy in the first place to, to go to wherever it was we went. I can't remember the prophet's name, but you know who I'm talking about. But um, uh, I, I'm interested in saying something about the meaning of Jesus Christ. I don't want it to be, sound this, be the same old thing. I've done that already one time. I spoke about uh, this. And then I forgot what I said the week before, and I uh, I had some notes, and, I, and the notes screwed me up. And I said the same thing I said the previous week, and I said it worse than I said it the previous week. So I ministered in saying something about the meaning of Jesus Christ. I went and watched a movie. Well, almost all of it uh, for the third time. Um, I don't know, a week ago, maybe a week ago. Same movie. I disliked the movie the first time and the second time and the bits I watched the third time. I didn't like the movie at all. Uh, the details don't matter. It wasn't bitterly bad. It was it was to promote the the time of the homosexual movement and all of that. Uh, it was that. That was all it was. And there wasn't any really good acting in it. Uh, and it's the name of a city. The, the name has gone. The music in it is what really uh, I thought was wonderful. And the third time I watched that, I watched it just to hear a single song by Maria Callas. And it's called Mama Morta. It's it's called it's offered as um, uh, the dead mother, or uh, they killed my mother, but its name is Mama Morta. The song I, I wish I wish you could listen to it. I'm not big on opera. I need you to know that opera is not my uh, big. I, that's my music. No, it's not. But I'm absolutely incensed with the great arias in those uh, uh, that what I'm supposed to say next. Um, those uh, one of the very famous uh, writers of uh, uh, the uh, the kind of singing I'm talking about. The word keeps slipping from me. He said the music is the easy part to do. What is the really difficult part is to get an incredibly good story. Yeah. Would you like me to share that uh, um, piece with the group? Maria Callas singing, I can do that now if you wish me to. Well, well, uh, no, uh, if, if okay. you do that, I'll not get done saying what I'm purposing on saying, but I am, but, but thank you for the offer. But I need to say, if you want to watch it, you need to watch it as a part of the movie, or, unless the, the, our boss there can offer it absolutely, you know, first rate. But you would also enjoy it best if you got to an English interpretation, you know, get it on Google and that, and have it front of you. That way then you will know what she's singing and the music will be 
absolutely incredible. They, uh, she uh, was a very, very troubled woman. I've, I've read enough of her auto work and then of the other people who write about her. And she had a pain filled life. But they, uh, they, they, they called her the divine one for her voice. This is my view, all right? But it's also the view of all of those who say they know uh, music of that kind. They say she's number one of them all. In that song, here's the, the story and this is where I want it to go. But I'd love you to listen to the song if you could and would, if, if it suits you. And I would love you to listen to it with a, um, an English um, copy in your hand so that you can hear what she's saying and singing. Here's what happens. The story is set in the, the, the time of the French Revolution. And during the worst days of all of that, it was absolutely unspeakably evil and brutal and all the rest of it. It started years earlier because of all the abuse of the poor and the jobless and all of that. You know how all of these things go. It wasn't the first of, a kind, of its kind. It has happened as far back as human history it is recorded. The same things create all of those. In the course of it, they're butchering and doing all the rest. In the song, Mama Morta, the mother and her daughter are fearing the coming of the killers and all of that. This is it. And the mother stands at the door, has the daughter hiding inside. They could have hid somewhere, but she believed that they would end up getting them anyway. So she stands there waiting for them to come. And she will not uh, let them in, or, or, or I forget how that works, but she wouldn't let them get to the daughter. And she gives her life for her daughter. And after that all clears up, the daughter is filled with absolute anguish, sees, not literally or anything, but, and, and hears, her mother talking to her. And the mother is saying to her, no matter what you see here, this is an incredible song and that. And when uh, the singer, uh, who's, every, every name's uh, is slipping from me, I'm sorry about this. But uh, as she's singing, the crowd then at the end will not stop applauding. They're absolutely regarded. And it's regarded as perhaps the number one rendering of any song and uh, that kind of um, music. The mother says to her, what you saw, what you've been expecting, all that's been happening, the brutality, the cries, the lies, and all of that. She said, all of that is real. But here's the big line in it that's repeatedly sung marvelously. And you see it in the movie. Uh, the movie is called what? what? What's the movie called? Philadelphia. Philadelphia. It's, a, in my view, a pathetic movie. But in Philadelphia, you see it and it goes well. And the song recurring phrase is, I am love. The mother is telling the daughter in the song. And, and, and Callus is absolutely brilliant. What would I know other than I heard her, you know, in the thing and I read about her and you would too. This girl is absolute. God gave that girl something extraordinary. And I'm saddened that her life was so this, that, and the other. Yeah. But she's singing through it. The mother is saying to her, 
all of that speaks. It's real, painful, destructive, all of that. But look at me, what I did and who I am is more than I am and said, me, I am love. And that's how it goes. And she becomes, for the listener, for the story, for the daughter in it, she becomes the defiance of all that went on during that awful time that still is leading to awful times. What happened there back in the late 70s and, and then on still is going on. It is what led uh, uh, America to rebel against the king who was abusing them. The, the birth of uh, the American Republic was sponsored by, as other nations were sponsored to, revolt and all of that. It was one of those extraordinary events, but brutal, unspeakably brutal. And she is singing defiance to the worst happenings that that whole era, Britain and everybody else, France and everywhere was experiencing. And the words put out on it, I don't remember the a man who wrote the uh, libretto for it, but she is saying, and you need to hear it. Well, I think you need to hear it if you want to hear it. She's singing, I am love. Not just I have shown love stronger than that, bigger than that. I am love. When you think of all the sorrow, when you think of all of this, that, and the other, remember who it is who gave her life for you. But note, more than that, it isn't just my mother who did that. This was love making itself present in a world that was hatred and abuse and every other wicked thought and word you could think of. Mm. And you, you, you know what that means. You don't have to be a preacher or anything like that. You don't have to be someone that gets all excited about that to know if you can't get Jesus Christ out of that. You can't read your Bible. What does Jesus mean? What does he mean? He's a person. First of all, he's not just a theory. All of that, you know, I won't go on about that. Jesus is not just some things that we believe. This is a being, but he is a young man. He's not God being God. He is God being a young man. Always God. Always God being, not God, because he is God, but he is God being this young human that we know as Jesus of Nazareth. What does he mean? He means, I am love. I don't only teach it. I don't only act it. I don't only sing it. I am the embodiment in humankind of love itself. For it is God 
who in me I have wanted to be. That's why I before I became the young human Jesus of Nazareth, I was equal with God. I was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was uh, with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by him, and anything that was created was created by him. Uh, and in him was light, and the light was the life of man. And then 114 of John, and the word became a human. Word became flesh, not just skin and bone, a human. And that human, that the word who was God, became Jesus of Nazareth. And the scripture says of God in chapter two of what? Somewhere. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Colossians, I know it's, it's first John probably. He, wherever it is, you know where it is. He says, uh, God is love. He said, he that does, he or she, they who do not, they who do not love. Listen. They who do not love don't know God. And why is that? The text says, because God is love. Doesn't mean he's made out of some kind of stuff or something like that. It's, he's, not a, he's not force. He's not stuff. He's human. But in him, in God, love exists. He is the embodiment of it. Without the existence of God, love doesn't exist. With the existence of God, the thing we call love exists. And then he says in another text that you're acquainted with, it was God's will. God says that. It was my will that in him in Jesus, the fullness of who I am is embodied. When you see him, when you watch him walking, you don't see me. I'm invisible. He's the visible declaration of who I am. But look at him. When you see him, you see love existing in a human. Hear the song if you choose. Hear the song. Get the words if you choose. Hear that thing and you listen to it again and again. And your mind will immediately go where it has been going all your lives. You heard it, how he did it to you and how he snuck up behind you and how he got into your heart and all that lovely non-abusive way of his, he entered and you have increasingly deepened and, and come to know him more. And God will say through Peter, let your love grow and wisdom and, uh, and and knowledge yeah and that's what's been happening to you yeah you have come to love him because he is that why does he do what he does it's a god thing it's a god thing but he is such a god with such a love who's so influential without any kind of beating or pushing or threatening or anything else, he turns people into lovers. For you've been doing precisely that. And you know of women and men who will push policemen aside and 
the, the, the people who put out the fires aside and run into a burning building, knowing they're not getting out the beloved one that they're going for. But humans, listen, humans are doing that. You're doing that. You, you, look, I'm not interested in talking about our sins. Dear God, we've heard enough about it, see enough about it, felt enough about it throughout our lives. I'm sick of it. I'm interested in saying that Jesus Christ means that love is life. And he says, I am love. I'm not just this lovely young human. I'm not just God being this lovely young human. I am love. Oh, I am love. And you, do you know why I am to you what I am? Do you know why I work with you as I work? Do you know why I speak to you and I intercede for you and all of that? Do you, do you know why I can't help it, so to speak? I am love. Love, says God, fulfills the law. Oh, no man anything except to love one another, for love is the fulfillment of the law. If there are any laws, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. And if there is any other law, can you come up with one, he says, whatever. All of it is fulfilled in loving. That's what Jesus means. And we who will not, will not love, we haven't a clue about God. When you say no to the love of God that is made fully manifest to us, in the young human. You're seeing the heart of God. And here's, here's what, what, what's the practical value of that? Oh, it, it's filled, but you know what it is when he sees it. But, but do you believe this? Not only will you die for your beloveds, you will die, gladly die for your beloveds. You do more than that. Are you still there? Hello? Hello? Yes, we're fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, my, my thing when I, hey, uh, when, he, when he sees you not only willing, and, 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 and people willing to die for strangers, Jesus said, uh, the greatest thing a person can do for his friend is to die for him. But he knows that there's an even greater thing to do than to die for your friends, to die for your enemies, which is, one more time, you're, you're back to God and Jesus Christ. God is love. Jesus of Nazareth, the human did all of this, and he looked around and saw people do it, and he speaks of people doing it. And I'm talking in the name of Christ, and you're agreeing in the name of Christ that you know people. I've seen people. You are people who are not only willing to die, but you live for them. Mothers who die in the centuries have gone without new clothing. Fathers who went without food, on and on and on, so that their children might get the best. Love lives for people and live for strangers also. 
think of genuine article, doctors and school teachers and all of that, who really put in the hours, who are not enemies of God. They haven't made themselves enemies of God. They're not these critics of God and all of that. Nothing like that. They are being worked on by God as you were worked on by God before you finally gave your life to the Lord Jesus. He was working on you and you were moving in his direction and you were doing yet your husbands, wives, children, parents, all of that. You were loving and living in love together. Yeah. Love. Love is not when we talk about the love of God. We're not talking about us, uh, about God being the kind that we sing endlessly romantic ballads about. Uh, some hymns just, uh, in my view, need to be taken gently, not, not harshly, but gently put aside. God, you don't sing romantic ballads about him. You cherish him and all of those things. And, and that cherishing and that warmth grows, it's true. Uh, but love of God is God's inner, his loving commitment. And that is what we are called to in loving our enemies and, and our neighbors and all of that. We are asked to commit ourselves to them. Love works no ill to its neighbor. And that's why love is the fulfillment of the law. But, but love is a man of war. You see it in, in fathers and, and sometimes strangers who jump into an absolute uh, a, a sea uh, for, uh, to save a child. One young man jumped into the water. A woman had lost her pup. And this might sign over over the top sort of stuff. It doesn't strike me that way because I had a dog that loved me and my Ethel and I loved it. We had talks one with another in English as well as doggies, that kind of thing. But uh, those, and then we have a wee dog here. Uh, uh, I forget the name of the wee dog. That's just my favorite now. She, she gives us life and joy. She makes us happy. You know how they are, all of that. And we, we get the feel about all of those are beautiful things. And I'm not putting any of that down. I think God feels about us. And I'm not interested in introducing two uh, views about all of that. And, and the arguments don't matter. We don't care. God loves us and feels things about us. We have scriptures to say that kind of thing. You can grieve him, we're told. But Jesus also says that you can make him happy. You can return to him. You remember the, the parable of the guy coming back home? And uh, Jesus said to his critics, uh, you know, having rejoicing that, that throws a party when somebody comes back home. God rejoices in our coming back home. But, but. But the love of God and the love of mothers and fathers, the lover, the lover, the love of some friends is fierce when it needs to be just that. And it's consistent and it stands. Yeah. Love never fails, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. It does not mean that that a lover will want something and will get it. That's not what he's saying. When he says love never fails, he means love never gives up. When he says, when Jesus says, and others say, pray without ceasing, he's not saying to pray 24 hours a day. He's saying, don't stop praying. No matter what you see, whether you're, Get, don't get what you ask for. Don't stop, he says. So the love of God never ends, but it's powerful. And he will show himself in power against all the powers. 
Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. And they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their strings from us. We're not wanting anyone to do it. Let's cast them away. But, and it's David who is the speaker. David says, but he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will have them in derision. He will speak unto them in his anger. And then God becomes the speaker. Yet, he says, they said, let's get rid of God. Let's get rid of his, his, his anointed one and all of that. God says, yet will I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. And now God speaks to David. You are my son. Trust me just for the minute that that's not an uncommon phrase. It's used of Jesus, of course, uniquely, an entirely different way, ultimately. But the phrase, you are my son, means I have chosen you to be my king. That's what was characteristic speech, yes? But in the text, God says to David, as he will later say about David's son, I will be to him a father, he will be to me a son, and I will give him the, the authority, okay? So back in Psalm 2, David is the speaker. David was God's anointed one, as you know. But he had a blessed hard time getting on the throne, and he had a massive bad time in staying on it. It wasn't just the enemy nations that were saying, let's do him in. Let's get rid of uh, God's anointed one. That was the foreigners, you know, you know the, the big guy that David killed and who he represented, that kind of thing. And then his own family, his own son sought his death and his own friend who he had been helping his own king wanted him dead. What, what, what was the king that wanted David dead? His own king. I can't remember. Saul. Saul. But Saul, thank Saul. you. Saul. Saul. So he wanted him dead. David could have killed him and all of that kind of stuff. And God preserved him. Everybody wanted him dead. And God said, yet, in spite of the nations, in spite of the people, in spite of the family, in spite of the powerful, yet will I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the utmost part of the earth for your possession. You will rule them with a rod of iron. You'll break them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be ye wise, therefore, O ye judge. Kiss the sun, in you know, kissing the hand the way they acknowledge. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. And he concludes, God concludes saying, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. That was a thousand years and the record of it, 950 years maybe, David became the king about a thousand BC, about a thousand years before Christ, David is saying all of that about his own 
being called by God and made to be the king. And you know how he acted as king of all the kings that Israel north and south ever had, he was number one. And throughout the scripture, it says so-and-so did well, but he didn't do it as David did it. This one did it, and that one did it, and the other one did it. The texts are not talking about David as a human, you know, just another fella. They're talking about David as the kingly representative. David had one thing, a single thing in his favor. God said of him, he is a man after my own heart. Can you believe it? He was a rascal. Not every moment or anything. But he was a rascal. He not only committed the adultery that you know, he killed her husband, not just her husband. He killed all the troops that were under her husband in the battle. And he told one of his leading general, see that it's done. Withdraw from him and leave him. And he did it. And that guy sent back the message, the job is done. And David says to the messenger, tell him not to think much about it. You know, the sword kills one or another. An absolutely heartless response to what was done. God said he's a man after my own heart. What? No. And throughout, he lies all over the place. And on one serious occasion, David is so faithless that he starts counting his armies to see, yeah. to see if his armies are big enough and strong enough and good enough to keep off the enemies so that he could keep his kingdom going. Huh. Yeah. And then when he was dying, He's up on his elbow. Uh, that's not in the Bible, I bet. He's up on his elbow. He's dying. And he says uh, to his successors, I want Uriah, not Uriah, the other name, it's gone from me. I want him dead. I want him dead, like something out of the, the, the movie. Uh, the, the, out of the movie. Um, that where the, where the gangster said, I want him dead, right? You know how they do it. That's what David said. He said, I want Adonijah dead, the one who would follow up as king instead of his son that he'd had from uh, the wife that wasn't his wife. I want him dead. And then he said to the, uh, about the other little man who he swore, the man said, are you going to kill me? His wife came with all the little goodies and that and begged him not to kill her husband, who was stupid. But nevertheless, David said to him, I will not kill you. But when he's dying, he said, I want Shimei, dad. And this is how he dies. And God says, he's a man after my own heart. He's not talking about I his see. moral character. He's talking about him as come what may. What evil he did and could do. There was no other God he would go to. He fought and put up with all kinds of things and all the way through. He swore and acted in the name of God to glorify God. So there's a message there for us that this is the case in the end. When they asked Jesus, what must we do to work the work, works of God? Jesus said, here is the work of God. 
that you believe on the one whom he has sent. Oh, then it doesn't matter about how you're sent. Well, of course it matters. Well, that sounds very, no, no, it, it, it doesn't sound like anything. God said this about that man who was like that. And God can't be endorsing the man's behavior. What he behaves and brags on is that man never left me. He had a hundred reasons, a thousand reasons maybe to say, I have no right to claim God as my God. But unless he throws me out, he's the only one I'm going for. And when you read the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and you read about the heroes there, well, sometimes sit down and reflect on them. Uh, the, 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 the man of faith, and he was a genuine man of faith. Twice his wife put her in harm's way. I think I, I mentioned that sometime just a little while ago. Anyway, he did all of that. It's not, it's not the character that wins. It's not, uh, there's something dangerous about becoming morally upright. It's a great thing, of course, and it's a right thing, but it's very seductive. And Jesus told the story. Two went to church. Did I tell this last week? I don't know. I'm going to tell it again, okay? He, uh, two went to church. One got in there. The other one couldn't go in. He had to stay, all right? And he, he couldn't lift up. He looked down. And one of them said, with a prayer, an opening line, God, I thank thee. First thing rattled out of his mouth. Wondrous. I thank you. And what did he thank him for? What did he thank God for? He thanked God that he was upright that he was law-abiding, that he didn't commit adultery, that he didn't steal, that he didn't this, and he didn't, and didn't, and didn't, and didn't. All of that, it cannot be wrong to do what is right. But it can be wrong when you have done right and you know who did it in you. It can be wrong when you do all of that and you are really I mean, a decent man or a woman, decent and fine in behavior. There's something wrong about it when you start glorying and thinking, I'm better than everyone else. And that's how that story opens up. Jesus told a parable about those who thought they were better than everyone else. Huh. Now, the story doesn't work if that, that preacher guy, a hymn singing, Bible reading, church attending, money given, truth speaking guy hadn't been actually that. And when he says, I thank you, God, he's talking to God. He can't con God. This is a decent guy. But his problem is, because I am that, I'm a bit, okay, maybe, maybe I'm a sinner, of course, but boy, I repent that marvelously, better than everybody else. And here's who I am. The other fellow can't go in, can't lift his eyes. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. There's a definite article in the Greek text which should be left there, and it's not usually rendered. He didn't say, as the Greek will have it, he didn't say, um, God be merciful to this sinner. God be merciful to uh, me, a sinner. He says, the sinner. He's either been called that by everybody, and that's his reputation, uh, and it's how he sees himself. God be merciful uh, to the sinner. And Jesus said, 
he's better in shape with a gun than the other is. Here's what I here's what I want. When you get time, to reflect on this. We know that's true because Jesus said so. I see end of the matter for you and me. But to think about it, how can Jesus do that? How can he do that? Here's this man who's obviously a bad egg and says he's a bad egg, admits it, so guilt-ridden. He can't go into the building and he can't look up toward heaven where God is, so to speak. And Jesus said, that man is in better shape than that man. How can he do that? And then here comes later, here comes this working girl who comes into a, a, a nice dinner that's been thrown by a church going hymn singing, Bible reading, all of that fella who invited Jesus to dinner. And here they all are. It was good of Jesus to go after they were so critical, all of that. But, you know, that's Jesus for you. And so anyone, and uh, then comes the working girl. Everybody knows who she is. She's well known. And here she comes. And she right up to him and starts to do her weeping and washing him and all the rest of it. And then the hymn singing, Bible reading, sermon preaching, money giving, upright guy said, no doubt to the others with a whisper. If he was holy, if he was the called one, he would know who she is. He would know exactly what she is. There's the proof. And the Holy One says to him, though this is not the text, he said to him, I know exactly who she is. Yeah, I know exactly who she is. I know what she is. You, you know what you know? You know what you think you know. You know some facts about her. Let me tell you something. She's a better woman than you've ever been a man. I come into this house here as a guest. You didn't give me any water. You, the, the water. you didn't give me anything. You didn't treat me like a, like a guest. She comes and what does she do? She treats me like someone worthy of worship and glorification and thanksgiving and all of that. All of that. Ah. You remember how God in, in, in the book of Job says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And he said, consider him. I've been watching that rascal. He is an absolute hypocrite. He's a self-serving and this, that, and the other, you know. That is what the cynic saw. What God saw was something else. And Jesus has this woman by him. And he says to the other guy, the church-going fella, I'm not opposed to church-going people. You are church-going people. I'm a church-going person. We're wanting to be decent and upright. We're doing, well, how about a shot? I'm giving our best. So we're trying it out. We're not putting that kind of thing down in the wall. But, but there's a danger in all of that. And it happens all the time that we succumb to it. Jesus said, let me ask you a question, mister. Misters in the Greek, if you have to know Greek to get it in there. That was a joke. All right. He said, he said, let me, let me ask you a question, mister. Who loves most? The one whose sins forgiven are many, many, many. Let's suppose he had said one who owed a billion dollars or someone who had few sins that needed 
forgiveness, maybe $50. Who loved, who will love the most? And the man said, well, obviously the one who was forgiven most. And Jesus said, you're right. And he's, he's following the proverbial uh, remark, of course, a lot of people are forgiven a lot and they don't, but he's, he's following what is characteristic. He said, you're right. The one loves most who is forgiven most and who comes like her. Pen, the pen doing all of this. How, how is that true? That's the question. Not, is that what Christ says and therefore is it true? Of course it's true. He says so and it's true. Why, why is it true? Why is that the one thing that God wants from us is to love him? He keeps saying to us, I just want you to trust me, okay? Just, just trust me. Well, trust and love aren't the same. Well, the two words are different. Of course they are. But in a life... Biblically speaking, and in the Christian life, you cannot have one without the other. Of course, they're different. They're ways of describing two aspects of life, but they're one life. When God says, I want you to trust me, he means I want you to commit to me, to me, not to something like me. Not that it's some thought or theory. I want you to keep it personal. I want you to commit to me. Well, what? Uh, uh, sinlessly? No, 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 no. God, it's safe. Don't even talk sinlessness. That's, that's a done deal. That's never going to happen. It can't. You're already that. And so that'll never happen. But thou shalt love the Lord your God, says the Christ, with Oh, your heart, soul, strength, mind, man. Yes? Well, that, that's sinlessness, surely. No, it's not. No, it's not. For my heart, my heart, not as pure as yours. My heart, not as rich as yours. My heart, for all kinds of reasons and the inner structure of humans and all of that, their life setting and all of that, they, they're, they're not up and able. Some are able to a degree that others aren't. When Jesus says, love him with all your heart, and I say, oh, well, wait a minute, uh, my heart is not as big as hers, he would say, I'm not talking to her, and I'm not talking about her heart. I'm talking about yours. Mm. And I say, yeah, well, uh, um, mine's a wee tiny one, and, and uh, I don't know if there's anything. Well, I'm not even sure um, that I love you. And God said, well, let me check. Let me check. And so he, he looks, takes it out, and he's looking, and I'm, behind him, leaning over his shoulder, and it's taking him a good while. And he's, he's, he's uh, uh, yeah. And I say, what? Hey, what? Uh, and he says, finally. Ah, oh, there it is. I said, what, what, what? And he says, the little spot, tiny little thing, but it's not as dark. It's, it's, it's got light in it. It's not like the, all the other deal. There, there, I have found love of me in your heart. I believe every word of that story. Uh, it's a made up, I just made up the story. Of course, you don't believe that's in the scripture. But in any case, I believe every word of that. I believe 
that when God says, love me with all your heart, he's saying, love me with anything you've got. Here I say to God, well, there's 100% here. I'll give you 99 and I'm going to keep in the other. He will say, no, 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 that won't do. Just, just give me all you've got. What, what have you got? What have you got? And we can say, by his grace, by his grace, I can believe. I can't believe in me. I don't trust me five inches, but I trust you every day and in every way. And he says, that's all you need. Trust me, for I brought you to this faith. I loved you when you never cared that for me. When you lived your life and did what you wanted to do and enjoyed it and thought nothing of me, I loved you then. I have always loved you more than you have loved your most favorite sin. I have always loved you. When you didn't care at all about me, now, now it matters to you whether you please me or not, and you're all disappointed in the fact that you haven't been doing this or been able to do that and hadn't done the things you should have done and done things you should, all of that, and I don't want to hear any more about it. All of that I die for. Ah, enough of it. Enough of it. Christ died for everybody in this group and everybody out of it. We have never met anyone in all our lives or ever will that he hasn't dealt with their sins. What is it that he did with their sins? Well, he didn't forgive them all. You have to say, uh, you know, I, 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 I want you to forgive me, you know, on, on that. But, but he dealt with their sins. What did he do with it? He did what lovely humans do. Day after day after day. With those they love. Children who break the parents' heart loved by parents, welcomed back. That is dealing with their sin. What does that mean? It means the sin that was destroying and keeping them apart and making them worse and worse and making them say, I don't, I don't want to be. They, the lover, would not let that, that thing, Kill what was in her or in him. They wouldn't let. They wouldn't let sin kill the love they had for their child. That's what God does. That's what he did right from the beginning. Love, love is not a sweetie, sweetie, little, you know, whimpery, <laughs> little, you know, nothing like that. Love is angry with evil <laughs> that keeps apart. God is a mad fiend against <laughs> evil. I hate you because you're killing my children. God and Christ dealt with it. And that's how he deals with it. He will not let it be the killer. And if the sinner comes like that little man and says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, God says, that's all we <laughs> Yeah. And, and the little girl who comes in and miss that and the other the story again. 
And Jesus looks at her and says, you're in. Everything is okay. And the big hitters, church going, him singing, you need to do more. You need to be like us. I'm glad I'm not like you. I'm glad I'm not, especially like that one right there, because that rascal, and they're telling the whole stories about all of those who have done whatever it is that they've done and won't give them a break. I made up the story where Peter, I made this up, it's not in the Bible. Peter wanted to go preaching at one big church in, in, in uh, we're going to say in Hollywood, uh, he, uh, in Jerusalem. And he went down there and he, and he went into preach and he got ready to preach. And the guy said, and what are you going to do? He said, well, I'm going to preach. You, you're not allowed to preach. <laughs> Aren't you the one that sat there cursing like mad and, and denying that you, 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 had, you, you were any part of the Lord Jesus? We wouldn't have you preach for anything. And Peter says, oh, I was talking to Jesus there just a week ago. And he said to me, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He thought it was okay for me to come in and get on with the job. Yeah. And in the Old Testament, the young, the, the young prophet guy, the young one, who, who was the young one who said, I'm just a boy. I can't remember. Sam, do you happen to know? A, a young prophet. He said, I'm just a boy. But one of them, you know who, you, you, you know, there is one like that. And he says to God, I'm just a boy. And God says, stop that. That boy later on was given a message. And the message was this. Tell Israel, I'm going to bring them down for all of their ungodliness and all of that. I'm going to bring them down. Well, he preaches for almost 40 years. Not a single convert on record. Jeremiah. Convert on record. Jeremiah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Jeremiah preaches for all of that time. Never gets a convert. He has some friends in the place, of course, that they keep an eye on out for him. But he started saying things to God, like this is in the text. Will you be to me? Um, um, and I've forgotten the text. Will the you sick, deceitful me? brook or a bow that won't shoot straight? Will you be a stream to me that isn't faithful? Will you be uh, a, 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 an archer's thing that's crooked and bent? And God says to him, this is in the text. God says... <laughs> I like God. I, I'm, 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 I'm get, well, I'm getting to like him. You, you know, I like him. You know, you know why I really like him? <laughs> he likes my Linda. He likes my Ethel and, and likes the two boys. And then, and then he likes you. And, and he likes some very dear friends of mine. I like him for all those reasons. But, but he, he, he you have to read plenty of Bible and, and, and get to enjoy them. And we're not all, all able to do that. There's some of us who are suffering right now who love God and we know that God loves us, but because of things, you know, that we're not able to, uh, we, we live miserable lives. So I, I get that and I'm not critiquing anyone. I'm just saying. But God says to him, if you stop saying these bad things about me, I'm going to let you be my servant. <laughs> That's what the text says. <laughs> if you would stop saying these bad things to me, I'll let you be my servant. Oh, what a bite that. Isn't yeah. he lovely? No kidding. Yeah. 